see those that have made it here today. <clears throat> we have a nice crowd. I'm sure there's some traveling, but uh, that's great. It's, I like to travel in the fall as well. It's a, a beautiful weather. We really appreciate it um, that God has blessed us with that. Changing of the seasons, I always like this time of year. As you see on the board today, our topic is God can use you. And the main audience, and hopefully we can all get something out of it today, but I like to speak particularly to the needs of the younger people today and to encourage the younger that God can use you no matter who you are or your particular strengths or talents or personality, God can still use you towards his glory. And we're going to look at a few different examples this morning of different Bible characters and the ways that God used them. And then apply that to ourselves as well. So our title reading is 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. There we go. 1 Timothy 4 and 12, I'm mostly reading from the New American Standard. This is the King James here, but it says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. So let no man despise thy youth. Let no, but nobody look down on your youth. And if I'd given this 10 years ago, I might have said, you know, it's to me as well, but not so much anymore. <laughs> but as time goes on, we all get older. Um, but God, he especially uses those that, I think he has a great place in his heart for the young people. <clears throat> young people have energy and strength and vigor and enthusiasm, and God can use them. So let no man look down on your youth. This is written by Paul to Timothy, and Timothy is one of the characters we're going to look at today. But he was young-ish. He, they say he was about 40 when Paul wrote this. Paul was an older Christian, possibly in his 60s at this point. But he says, let no man despise thy youth. Basically, don't let them look down on you because you're young. You can still do good things for the church and for God. Psalm 71, verse 5, For you have been my hope. O Sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. So one of the other characters we're going to talk about today is King David. This is Psalms, uh, I believe, written by David. But truly, God was his confidence since his youth. We're going to talk about a little bit about the story of David and Goliath today. And these were not just empty words that David was saying. Here he truly had confidence, and God was his strength. And he was a great inspirational character in that way. So today we're going to focus on Timothy, David, and Daniel, three great, fairly young heroes in the Bible, and some of the things that they accomplished. And I want to compare and contrast them a little bit, and to look at the, their different personalities and the way that God was still able to use them, even though they were pretty different. And that was interesting to me in that way. We could have talked about others. We could have talked about Esther. I just gave a two-part lesson about her. She was young and she accomplished a lot of things that she did in King's Court, becoming the queen, and she saved her people from slaughter, from annihilation by the, uh, by the evil Haman. So she was super influential. She used her talents and her influence to save the Jewish people from all being killed. It was a great inspiration. We could also talk about King Josiah. He became king of Israel, um, I believe it was Israel, whenever he was eight years old. And he accomplished great things as well. And the second book of Chronicles says, In the eighth year of his reign, he began to seek the God of his father, David. So the Jewish people had fallen away. They were worshiping idols. And he brought them out of that to a degree. In the twelfth year of his reign, he began a program of destruction of the altars to Baal and so forth. So he was still just a teenager at this point. So very impressive what he was able to accomplish. Uh, we could also talk about Joseph. I guess we are talking about all these a little bit, but we could talk in more depth about any of them. And there's 10 or 12 other characters you could pick. Joseph was a great one. Think about what happened to him. He was literally sold into slavery whenever he was young by his brothers. It doesn't get much worse than that. The very people that should have loved him and protected him, his older brothers, sold him into slavery. But God used him in Egypt to, to accomplish great things, ultimately to save the Jewish people, um, or at least his family, from a great famine and kept them alive. So later in his life, he saved the very people that sold him into slavery. So all interesting things we could talk about. But today we're going to talk a little bit first about Daniel. So if you'd like to turn along, 
I'm going to read a few of these verses in Daniel chapter 1. Now, Daniel was an interesting character. We have a lot about him. The book of Daniel is pretty long. There's a lot of prophecies, a lot of dreams he interpreted and so forth. Um, interesting stuff in the book. But it starts off, and it's at the, the stage, the setting is that Israelite people are carried away into captivity. They're all captured and taken away into captivity by the Babylonians, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem, it says here, and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels in the, into the treasury of his God. So, commentaries that I read say Daniel was probably about 15 years old at this point, and he was taken from his homeland into captivity. And it's interesting that study about Esther that I did, she was taken from her family um, to become a candidate to be queen by the Persians. The Persians took over, they destroyed the uh, Babylonians, so, and that was right after this. Daniel was probably still alive at the time of Esther. A kind of a similar story, but at this point, that's the historical context. So if you're following along in your in your Bibles, I don't have this on the board, but it says, The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had the ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered them to teach the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice of food and the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. So I hadn't realized this before, but these names that they assigned to them were honoring pagan gods. It's exactly opposite of what these young uh, Jews would have wanted. So Daniel's name, Daniel means God is my judge. It's a great name. They gave him a name called the servants of Baal, the servants of their top god. So Belteshazzar, a terrible name. Um, Hananiah means the Lord is gracious, and they gave him a name called Shadrach, which is inspired by the sun god. So, insulting for him as well. Mishael, his name was, who is it that God is? And they gave him the name Meshach, which means, who is what the moon god is? So, that's almost like they're trying to be funny. They, they took a similar name um, as far as who is God, and they said, who is the moon god? So, we're just going to, you know, one-up you with your own name. And Azariah means the Lord helps. And they gave him a name, the servant of Nebo, another pagan god. So, you know, they were polytheistic, the Babylonians, they had many gods that they worshipped, including the king Nebuchadnezzar thought that he was a god as well, and another story in Daniel, he wanted them to worship a massive statue of himself, and that's another story though. But I just wanted to point these things out, showing what a disadvantage these young men were at. They were probably young teenagers, 13 to 15 at this time, they are taken away from their families, they are taken away into captivity into the king's court to be trained to serve him, given random heathen names, and basically absorbed into that culture. You're going to eat the king's food, you're going to wear our clothes, you're going to do everything in our culture, we're just going to change everything that you were about and make you become us. So the question is, how would they respond? How would Daniel respond? Moving on, in verses 8 to 21, we'll go ahead and read that. <clears throat> And again, it's not on the board, but you can read along if you have your Bible. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid <coughs> excuse me, of my lord the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
I think it's interesting the Bible still gives them their real names here. It doesn't refer to them by their, their other names. Please test your servants for ten days. Let us give some vegetables to eat and waters to drink. And let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food. And deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine which they drank, and keep giving them vegetables. As for the poor youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence, and every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for, pre for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king. The king talked with them, and out of them, not all, out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the musicians and conjurers who were in his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. So several things here that are interesting. Um, we might say, why did it matter what food they ate or what they drank or vegetables versus the wine or whatever? And I don't have a great answer for that other than to say, I think they were really just making a stand um, that they didn't want to be part of that culture. The Jewish people as well were probably forbidden from eating certain kinds of foods. But also I think it was kind of Daniel just thumbing his nose at the king and saying, I'm not going to do what you want. I'm not going to be part of your culture. He gave us these fake names. The least I can do is not eat your food. I'm going to still be myself in some way. And then I believe that God sort of miraculously gave them super health and abilities and this kind of thing so that the food they ate made them appear healthier than the others and so forth. But um, And then he blessed them. And Daniel continued on in the service of the king for another 70 years. And he was very influential to the king. And... Um, not that he made the king a holy person by any means, but he did some good in his life for sure. So the point of this is that Daniel was a determined person, and that was his character. I think that he was able to stand up against peer pressure um, in, in a really difficult situation for him. You know, he's a young person. They give him a fake name. They're trying to give him, you know, these costumes to wear and random food to eat and trying to make him act a certain way completely forget about God and his people, he just said, no, even though I'm here, I'm going to work in this position that God has given me, and I'm going to be useful, and I'm going to do it on my terms, and God allowed that to happen against all odds. You know, they easily could have just, uh, you know, killed him and said no, but, you know, he was able to succeed in that way. So he was a young, determined individual, and that's an inspirational thing, an inspirational story to me. So the next story is King David. This is before he was king. And this is the story of David and Goliath. And it really gives us an idea of bravery. I believe we're all familiar with this story. Um, we're going to go over and read part of it, not the whole thing, because it's a pretty long reading. But David and Goliath, I've always loved this story. Let's just turn over to 1 Samuel, if you would like to follow along with this one. 1 Samuel chapter 17. It says, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Sokoth and Azekoth and Ephes Danon. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with the valley between them. And the champion came out from the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. And it goes on and describes him more. But I looked it up and he was nine feet nine inches tall. So the setting here is pretty interesting. You've got a valley on one side, you've got an army of the Israelites on one. On the other side, you've got the army of the Philistines. And this guy comes out who's close to ten feet tall. And that gets their attention, you know. So moving on. It says, down to verse 12, and it talks in between about his armor and how much it weighed, and it's all basically just very impressive. You know, he was, his spear was like a telephone pole, I mean, essentially, or at least a basketball pole. Bill Post, the guy was massive. Very intimidating character. And he comes out and he says, Sin, I want to do one-on-one -on -one battle with someone. 
you know, I don't think one on ten would have got, they wouldn't have done that. But he says, I want to challenge you to one on one combat and let's see what happens. And in verse 12, and then it says that he, uh, verse 12, David was the son of the Ephriat of uh, Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And G Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among them. So introduce David. He's the youngest of eight siblings. And people think, from what I read, that he's likely maybe 13 or 15 years old at this time as well, similar age to what Daniel was in our other story. And David is going back and forth. It says in verse 15, from Saul to tend his father's flock at Bethlehem. So David was a shepherd boy. And he was taking care of sheep. His brothers, several of them, um, I believe three or four of them are with the army. And they're waiting there, uh, watching this spectacle happen with Goliath. And one of these verses, I'm trying to see, I think it might be a little bit later. But it says that Goliath came out and gave his challenge to the armies of Israel for 40 days straight. So David was also bringing food to his brothers in this meantime. Um, but interestingly, when he goes to his brothers, he's like, who is this guy that's standing up on this mountain challenging all of us, and why are we just sitting around doing nothing? So verse 20, it says, David arose early in the morning and left the flock with the keeper and took the supplies he's bringing food to his brothers. And he went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array, shouting a war cry. So... <laughs> They're shouting a war cry, but it doesn't mean much because for 40 days they're not going to take this guy's challenge. It's all for show. Um, Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. So one on one side, one on the other of the valley. David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion of the Philistine from Gath named Goliath was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these words, and David heard them. While all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him and were greatly afraid. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he is coming to defy Israel. And who it will be that the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and he will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. <clears throat> and David spoke to the man who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills the Philistine? and takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? So David has some confidence, you know. He's uh, a young man, but he sees this 10-foot tall giant, and he sees him disrespecting the armies of God, and he doesn't, he's not going to have it. But this part of verse 28 is interesting. Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, Eliab's anger burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down, and with whom have you left the few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to see the battle. So not necessarily that it's a bad thing, I don't think, for him to come see the battle, you know, but I think he just didn't really like his younger brother. Um, it's sort of a sad thing there. David said, what have I done now? Was it not, not just a question? Um, and you can just kind of imagine the family dynamic, you know, the, the youngest brother is like, what have I done? You turn on his heel and uh, brother to brother conflict. Or, he turned away from him to another and said the same thing, and the people answered the same thing as before. So his brother just kind of thinks he's talking big, but David's just kind of gathering information at this point. Then down in verse 31, it says, When the words which David spoke were heard, they told him to Saul and sent for him. David said to Saul, for Saul's the king, Let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant's heart, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. So this is the first thing indication we have of what David is planning. We know that he's insulted by Goliath, but now he plans he's going to take up the challenge. Saul says, You were not able to go against the Philistines to fight with him, for you are but a youth. But he has been a warrior from his youth, not to mention he's ten feet tall, but he's trained well. You know, he's a professional soldier um, who's skilled as well as large. David is a shepherd boy. David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock. I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. It's a little bit like a job interview. He's saying, Here's my qualifications. I can kill some things, which it is impressive. 
But more than that, he's saying that God is help, God helps me do that. You know, God helped me to kill this lion and this bear that came up after the sheep. God can help me kill this giant. It's God doing the work on me. David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, the paw of the bear, he will deliver me. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. So impressive of Saul to allow it, you know, or maybe irresponsible. Here's the king, and here's a 13-year-old kid, and he's like, okay, go ahead. No one else is going to do it. Um, you know, imagine if David had failed. That would have been just even more discouraging for the army, right? I'm not sure if they would have had another stalemate for another 40 days. Eventually they run out of food, and they can't just be, keep doing this forever. But it's over a month now that this has been going on, so the king is evidently, he's like, okay, this kid's probably going to die, but go ahead. Or maybe he believed that God would protect him. I'm not sure. But in any case, he allows him to go. Then Saul gives David his armor and so forth. Of course, it's way too big. It doesn't fit. And David ends up saying, I can't move. I'm just going to go. Without this, I just want to take my slingshot. Um, interesting point. A slingshot, if used well, can be a pretty deadly weapon. Those who know how to use it are sling rocks or throw things. Um, small stones can do some damage. But David probably practiced it a lot, you know, out on the hills with his sheep. And shepherds did have things. They encountered dangers, lions, bears, wolves, this kind of thing. So it's not like he was helpless, but still, it seems like a mismatch. <clears throat> so then the battle scene comes down to verse 41. The Philistine came on and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. The Philistine looked and saw David. He disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, spear, javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. So we'll see that Goliath had these things. And he probably also just let his guard down because he saw this kid and didn't think that anything could come of it. Um, or else he could have killed him immediately. Um, but I believe part of David's success, God helped him as, as well, of course, but I believe Goliath kind of let his guard down a little bit. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, says David. I will strike you down and remove your head from you. Uh, David also said he... You come to me with these things, but I will come to you in the name of God. So basically, your strength, your height, your weapons, your experience, the whole situation doesn't matter because God's going to help you. So what great faith and bravery did David have? It's amazing, really. Um, all the assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand into the bag and took from it a stone and slung it and struck the, Phil struck the Philistine on his forehead. So I kind of picture he's running and grabbing and throwing at the same time. Pretty athletic move, really, and pretty impressive. Uh, great aim and so forth. But at this point, and struck the Philistine on his forehead and the stone sank into his forehead. So it came with some velocity. So that he fell on his face to the ground, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the valley to the gates of Ekron. And the slain Philistine lay along the way to Shera and even to Gath and Ekron. The sons of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and plundered their camps. Then David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his weapons in his tent. Now when Saul saw David going out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander, Abner, whose son is this? And Abner said, By your life, O king, I do not know. The king said, You inquire whose son the youth is. And then they tell him that it's David, the son of Jesse. And David, of course, later became the king of Israel, and he surpassed Saul. And um, they had a sort of a, a tough relationship, David and Saul. But um, David ultimately surpassed him and became probably the greatest king that Israel ever had, but it started with this great, brave incidents here, and he did many other brave things throughout his life. So I bring all that up just to mention that David was an exceptional, brave character. He's an easy hero. He's an easy one to really admire because 
it's almost supernatural, and I guess it was, the things that he accomplished to kill this great giant soldier. Really, if you stop and think about it, it was pretty remarkable that that occurred and that he was able to do that. So he's sort of your prototypical, almost superhero character, right? He was determined, he was brave, Daniel was determined. So these two, first two characters, they're easy to, to admire and to appreciate and to think, you know, I could never be like that. How could I do that? You know, I'm sure I'm not very good at slingshots. I'm not that brave in the face of peer pressure like Daniel was necessarily. Um, I could probably cave under a lot less peer pressure than that. Um, I don't see myself being exactly a lot like either one of those characters. So that's why I wanted to bring up the third one, which is Timothy. You know, our first verse we read today says, "Look, let no one look down on your usefulness. Let no one despise thy you." And that phrasing is interesting because it gives us some insight into who Timothy was and what his personality was like. So Timothy was not necessarily, I don't believe, a brave or determined or he wasn't a lot like Daniel or David, but he was a little bit weaker in some way. And I believe the Bible bears out that Timothy was somewhat timid. I didn't realize this until I started studying this topic. And I kind of leaned into it a little bit and found that it was true. 1 Corinthians 4 and 14. So this is written by the Apostle Paul, who was Timothy's mentor, right? It says, um, let's see if I can get it. Right, one. I'm writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with you with what I teach everywhere in every church. So Timothy was Paul's protege. He went with him. He was a convert out of Lystra. Um, and he was the spiritual son of Paul. So he says, Timothy, my son whom I love, not his physical son, but his spiritual son, <coughs> converted. And he traveled with Paul all around um, during his second missionary journey. He went to multiple places. As well, some other things that Timothy did. So just here's a list of Timothy and Paul's time together. So Timothy accompanied Paul on his second missionary journey. And these journeys took a couple of years. So he was with him daily for a couple of years. And he accompanied him to various places in Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Achaia. He was with Paul in Ephesus for more than two years. He was sent to Corinth to, Corinth to deliver Paul's, Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, and that's this right here. I'm sending Timothy. So he was literally, this is before the post office. If you get a letter, Timothy, he's bringing you the letter uh, by hand. Um, so he was Paul's trusted representative you know, to the churches. He was with Paul in Macedonia when 2 Corinthians was written. He was in Corinth when Romans was written. He was with Paul during his first imprisonment in Rome. And this is where he wrote Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. He was sent by Paul to Ephesus to deal with challenges of false teachers and appoint leaders in the church. And there were two letters written to Timothy as well. So that's most of the books that Paul wrote. Timothy was involved in some way or with him along the way. So I'm sure Paul was talking to him about all the things he was writing. And, you know, Timothy was going out, helping to establish churches. Very influential character. So he did a lot of good. But it's implied here that it was easy to look down on Timothy. Why was that? Let no man despise thy youth. It's not, it's not just for his youth. Um, I think there's a, a few other issues there. It's possible Timothy is somewhat introverted. We don't have proof of that necessarily. But some of the things that Paul says makes you think that. We are told that he suffered from frequent illnesses, and he had stomach ailments, and Paul advised him to drink a little wine for medicinal pur purposes. And Paul spends a lot of time in the books of First and Second Timothy just encouraging Timothy. So he needed a lot of hand-holding, a lot of encouragement. And that's interesting. It gives you more insight into how he was. Philippians 2 gives another insight into his personality. In verses 19 to 24, it says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. This is Paul writing this. That I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. 
For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those in Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I go, as soon as I see how things go with me. I am confident in the Lord, in the Lord, that I myself will come soon. So it says I have no one else like him. So he completely dependent on him. He's like his right hand man. He's his confidant. He's his. Uh, as he travels, he's helping Paul out as the older person. He's probably bringing him his coffee, I don't know. He's, he's helping Paul out in many ways. He's like his assistant, his protege, and Paul is the older mentor. He says, I have no one else like Timothy. He will show genuine concern for your welfare. So Timothy is an empathetic, this is one of his strengths. This doesn't speak to him being timid, but he was an empathetic, sensitive, concerned, caring type of person. So consider this. Paul is reputed to have a fairly forceful, decisive, resilient type personality. Timothy may have been more sensitive and empathetic and shy. Which one of these do you think he might be more like? They both worked together closely, and they both were able to accomplish great things, but they're completely different. Timothy was completely different from, say, David or Daniel as well, or Peter. A lot of times I'll almost in my brain lump Peter and David together because they're similar personalities. They're very forceful and brave. But I don't think Timothy was necessarily like that. It says he was he was very concerned and caring for people. This is another incident here that gives me some insight into what Timothy was like just day to day. And this is in the letter to him. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace and mercy from God, and peace from God the Father in Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God who my serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your fears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded now that also lives in you. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is through you playing on, on my hands. For the spirit God gives us does not make us timid, it gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony of, of our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in the suffering of the gospel. So there's several uh, more clues in this passage. We're calling your tears, it says. Then it says he has sincere faith. And then he's encouraging him that God does not make us timid. So Timothy's timid. He needs a lot of encouragement. Paul's saying, and then don't be ashamed of the testimony. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. So don't just kind of fade into the corner, um, you know, in an introverted way. Don't be timid and fearful, Timothy. You have a lot to offer, and go ahead and offer it to people. You can do some good, is what I'm reading from that. This is to the first in 1 Corinthians as well. And this passage, I think, gives the most proof about the character of Timothy as far as just his personality and how he might interact with others. Paul says, after I go through Macedonia, I will come to you. I'll be going through Macedonia. Uh, I'll be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because the great door for effective work is open for me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, this interesting. Follow this part closely. It says. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him with my brothers. Why would Paul say these things if Timothy was a big, forceful, strong character? You know, he's saying, basically when Timothy comes, don't run him into the dirt. You know, don't stomp on poor little Timothy. He's timid. He needs some encouragement. Don't treat him with contempt. See that he has nothing to fear. Then in the chapters, the books of 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy, you have nothing to fear. Don't be timid. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Now he's telling other people, don't give them something to be afraid of. Don't treat him with contempt. So I'm not sure why it was. Maybe he was just sort of small and sickly, or maybe he had sort of a quiet personality. But people kind of tended to pick on Timothy a little bit, I think. Isn't that interesting? Um, and Paul was really sensitive to that, and he's just, he's telling him straight out, be nice to my friend. 
be nice to my um, my partner as he comes, and don't treat him with contempt. You know, listen to what he's got to say. He may not present it in the best way, but he has a good message. That's how I read that. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting. It's possible that Timothy might have just been a little easy physically to intimidate, a little bit easy to scare. But um, he's telling these people, don't do that. If you pick on Timothy, I'm going to come beat you down later, is what I read from this, is what Paul's saying. So as far as our application this morning, we've made some contrast between these three characters. You know, Daniel was determined. He stood up against peer pressure. David was brave. He stood up against a literal giant and killed him. And Timothy was, you know, he was different. He was sensitive. Which one did the most good for God? I don't think you can you can quantify it in that way. God used them all in their own way. But you could almost make the argument, you know, in the New Testament at least, of course, um, for the time period that he was working, Timothy did, did a lot of good, despite his deficiencies. So I bring that up just as an inspiration to us. We may not be, um, I know I'm not like a prototypical hero, you know, um, to look at a person like Timothy and to say that God can use everybody. So I start mission at the beginning that this lesson is for the young people. You know, young people, you're making a lot of decisions in your life. There's a lot that you're going through. There may be uncertainty. There may be fears that you have, different things that you're looking at. Should I go this direction or that direction? Just realize no matter your personality or your strengths, God can use you. Now, not every young person is sensitive or shy. Not every young person is brave or outgoing. Some, a lot of us are kind of in the middle, kind of a mix of that. But God can use you no matter who you are. And that goes not for just the young, but for all of us, of course. So I'd encourage you this morning to think about your role in the church, your role. What way can God use you? You know, we all have our different strengths and so forth. Does God need you to go out and slay the proverbial giant? Or does he need you to kind of be war in the shadows, encouraging people one-on-one, for instance. There are different ways that different people can help God. And so as a young person, just realize your worth and realize what you can do for God, because it may not look like what people would necessarily be real impressed with, but it's still doing a lot of good for God sometimes behind the scenes is the point. Ephesians 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may go well with you. You may enjoy long life on the earth. So just some general advice to the young. For teenagers and young adults, Ecclesiastes 12 says, Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. Ecclesiastes 11, But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and in the sight to walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. Know that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. So to the young people, you're not always going to be young. Um, the days will draw near, <laughs> the evil days, let's say, when you've got random aches and pains, you may not want to get up and go to work, you may not want to you know, do the things you need to do. Life is not always easy. You might develop chronic health problems. Those that you love might have health problems or die. Um, you know, various things could happen to you that are not good. So while you're young and you feel invincible, go ahead and use that. You know, that's advice to the young, I would say. Um, a lot of the young are not like Timothy. A lot of them are like David and Daniel. They're, in, they're inspirational to those of us that are, are older. You know, they're young and they're strong and they're brave and they can get out there and do great things for God with their zeal and their energy, you know? And that's impressive, and that's inspirational to those of us that are older. But God says, you know, it's not always going to be that way. Just remember how quickly life goes by. It does go by quickly. You're not always going to have perfect health and strength. Finally, some advice for all of us. Lessons not just to the young, but this applies to the young as well. Matthew 16, Jesus said to his disciples, if any man come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. For why does a man profit it if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? 
So this first is great because it's a three-part command. You do three separate, easy to remember commands. First one is deny yourself. Basically, if you want to do something that's selfish or just for you and not for God, you can't do that. You're going to have to follow God. You take up your cross, you take up your burden, maybe the thing you don't want to do. You pick it up and you take, you face it head on, and you follow Jesus. You know, Jesus took up a literal cross for us. He gives us figurative crosses. He gives us challenges that we have to face daily, and we have to meet those challenges head on. This song we sing is a great song. It says, Who You Say I Am. And I think it just speaks to God can use all of us. So I just leave those boards on the word those words on the board for you to consider. But, you know, God can use each one of us. We are all a child of God. God values all of us, and we are who God says we are. It says, in my Father's house there's a place for me. I'm a child of God, yes I am. So God has a place for all of us. I like that, to, if you remember one thing today, just remember God has a place for all of us. We all come from different backgrounds, different strengths and talents. But there's a place in God's house for each one of us. And who are we? What is our identity? We are who God, we are who you say I am. Who does God say we are? God says that we are worthy of his love. We are imperfect people, and yet God loved us enough to send his son to die for us and to give us salvation. That's who God says we are. God doesn't say, God doesn't say that we're a list of our failures. God doesn't say that we can't help him. God says... And I think we've proven this morning that he can use us. He says that we are valuable to him. So just a beautiful song. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. So we need to recognize that we are children of God. And as such, we need to obey God. Psalms 23, this is our last reading. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I gave a whole lesson about this chapter, but it's just a great chapter. You know, David was a shepherd boy, but the Lord is also our shepherd. What does that mean? It means that we are his sheep. We are simple creatures that need someone to lead us. What do those three characters we studied this morning have in common? They wouldn't have had any success without God leading them and helping them. You know, David couldn't have killed that giant without God's help. Timothy couldn't have overcome his fear and his weakness and timidity without God helping him and Paul encouraging him and those around him helping him. Um, Daniel could have just allowed himself to be absorbed into that culture and to eat the king's meat and so forth, but he relied on God and his faith to get him through that. But we today have to rely on the Lord to be our shepherd and to lead us in his way. That means we as sheep have to be humble. We have to realize that God's way is better than ours. We have to follow him in his way. And there's really only one way to Jesus. We have to hear the word of God first, as we've tried to preach some today. We have to believe in God's word and repent of our sins, realize we're not perfect, we can't do it ourselves. We have to confess of our sins before peace before men. And ultimately we believe that you have to be baptized by immersion to enter the kingdom of God. To contact, as Brother Gary mentioned eloquently this morning, the blood of Christ, which gives us forgiveness of sins. It comes through baptism and contact with that blood. But it all starts with the decision to let your shepherd lead you. Realize that God is greater than us and that our strength, no matter if you're young and strong or older or not so much, it comes from God and we need to let God be our shepherd. So I encourage you this morning to allow God to lead you in your life. If you are a Christian, just allow God to keep leading. Realize that God can use you in many ways, but only if you're sensitive to his leading. So. Search the scriptures daily to find what you believe your purpose in your life is. It's different for all of us, and for each of us it may change over time as well. God has a purpose for you today. It may not be the same tomorrow. But God, if you let him, he will lead you in the right ways in your life. So uh, that's my message for today. Um, I hope it's been an encouraging one. I enjoyed this topic. Um, we can get so much out of the Bible just by random character studies. Um, but I think that it's... Uh, been inspirational to me. At this time, we're going to stand and offer a song of invitation. If there's one who would like assistance of the church, please come forward and we'll help you with that.